Uh, hopefully I can uh, pick up where Bonnie left off and uh, talk a little bit about why uh, Great Salt Lake is what we would consider an avian oasis. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to lightning through all of this as fast as I can because I get a lot of info here. Uh, but I'll run through a, a, a year in, at Great Salt Lake. Um, and we'll just uh, go through each of the seasons. Uh, so we'll start off with the spring migration because that's right where we're at right now. We see a lot of birds coming from their wintering grounds uh, headed towards their, uh, where they want to uh, breed. Uh, so some of the, those birds will have their destination here and a lot of them uh, will be just traveling through. Uh, Great Salt Lake is centered in or uh, affiliated with the Pacific Flyway. About a billion birds use the uh, th that flyway. And uh, it's important to uh, where Great Salt Lake is located, it's a key to habitat integrity of the Pacific Flyway. And what I mean by that is uh, uh, it's, it's located in this cold desert region where water features are few and far between. So if those birds get here and they're not uh, able to uh, get what they need, uh, they've got a long ways to go. Um, it also, uh, we get a lot of birds that come from the Central Flyway as well, but more, uh, more so in the Pacific Flyway. So Great Salt Lake. Uh, serves as uh, for the birds similar to what it would serve for us if we went on a vacation. We got to stop and get fuel at some point. Uh, that's exactly what happens with these uh, birds. They uh, come to Great Salt Lake. This is kind of a pit stop for them and they uh, head on out and uh, uh, after they've refueled, kind of what uh, Bonnie was talking about with all the uh, brine flies and invertebrates, we have over 12 million birds that utilize uh, uh, Great Salt Lake uh, on a regular basis. And I'm going to go hit some of the highlight birds uh, here. The Wilson's phalarope. Uh, we have the largest uh, staging concentrations of uh, Wilson's phalarope in the world here at Great Salt Lake. Uh, half a million birds strong. Uh, you see these birds uh, uh, when they're flying, they look like smoke or uh, as they fly and change direction, it looks like smoke or a, a ribbon in the uh, uh, wind. So these birds, we had a PhD student that, uh, well, she's a doctor now, and she uh, identified both Ogden Bay and Farmington Bay as crucial habitats for these, uh, uh, for the phalaropes. Unfortunately, in fact, in the middle of her uh, study, uh, Ogden Bay basically went dry and we just didn't see uh, the birds there the second year of her program. And basically Farmington Bay has gone uh, dry over the uh, last decade as well. So we're uh, reducing the amount of habitat and this is what they're feeding on, just like Bonnie said, the brine flies. Uh, and that fuels them for their thousands of miles of uh, journey that's uh, ahead of them. So we get, that's just one species. We have over uh, 300 different species that uh, utilize the lake. So I'm obviously not going to go over all of those, but I uh, do want to hit some of the really good uh, representatives here. So this is the another shorebird, the marble godwit. And Great Salt Lake is the only staging area for marble godwits uh, in the interior U.S. Uh, we get over 40,000 of them here, and uh, most of the time they spend, or most of their time is spent in Bear River Bay and uh, Willard Spur, um, as well as the refuge. And they're probing into the mud to get, uh, take advantage of invertebrates uh, that are there. However, it's hard to probe uh, in dirt. Uh, it's a lot less effective, so it's almost like jackhammering through uh, concrete. And these birds aren't able to, to do that, take advantage of uh, uh, the invertebrates if they're not there, or there's no habitat available for them. Uh, waterfowl species that we see a lot of is tundra swans. 75% of the entire Western population uh, comes here, uh, about 75,000 uh, tundra swans, and they're relying on a different uh, uh, food source, and that's the aquatic, uh, sub submerged aquatic vegetation. In particular, that's uh, sago pondweed tubers. Uh, and they come through here twice a year, usually uh, uh, big numbers in the fall as well as the spring. So we just had 
uh, Swan Day last, uh, this past weekend. Uh, they're coming from the Central Valley in California and then heading uh, from here up to Alaska where they'll be uh, uh, nesting. So all of these birds, like Bonnie mentioned, are attracted to these highly uh, productive uh, wetlands. And she said she didn't uh, uh, hit on this. Well, uh, I plan to do that. Um, we, as she mentioned, with uh, these wetlands, the uh, reduction in salinity actually increases the diversity for uh, species that use it, as well as the species of vegetation, as well as uh, insects that uh, also, also use these areas. Uh, we have a lot of a, a diverse amount of habitat, submergent, emergent, wet meadow, playa. All of these areas have great uh, numbers of acreages along the uh, eastern side of uh, Great Salt Lake, and they supply these birds uh, with a lot of forage. So this is almost the obligatory uh, maps of uh, Great Salt Lake at its highest, at its average, and then at its lowest, which is what we see here. And mostly what I wanted to uh, uh, call your attention to is uh, that eastern uh, side of uh, uh, the Great Salt Lake, which has reduced a lot of that uh, wetland habitat that is more productive. So when we uh, hear people talk about, well, the Great Salt Lake is half of what it used to be, it's even less than half over on these more productive uh, marshes and habitats, especially in Bear River Bay, Ogden Bay, and uh, Farmington Bay, where you just see this as kind of a brown uh, batch of dirt. So uh, the cool part is, is when Great Salt Lake is uh, high, its dynamic shoreline makes it uh, really productive for a lot of these uh, invertebrates that uh, they feed on, especially in the marshes. Um, it gives these uh, birds a lot of different locations that they can take advantage of and uh, unique habitat types. And that takes us into uh, the summer season, but I'm gonna call it nesting season because that's what uh, birds are doing at that time. So if they're here in the uh, middle of the summer, they're mostly here uh, uh, to reproduce and feed their uh, chicks and raise their chicks. Um, so, this is when we see uh, peak numbers of insects. And if you've been on the marsh in the summer and didn't wear mosquito repellent, uh, you probably regretted it. And that's uh, uh, a good thing for the birds, not so much for us. Um, so we see this huge number of insects that uh, are produced in these marshes that provide a uh, food source for a lot of these uh, birds. Then like Bonnie was uh, talking about, this is uh, the microbialite habitat. It's not homogenous throughout the lake. It's just around these edges. Uh, so this red indicates where microbialite habitat uh, is located. Uh, and so it's not in the deeper portions of the lake, so uh, we start losing it. And uh, here's just a picture the, uh, of a productive uh, field of microbialites under the water, and this is what uh, uh, the same exact location and what it looked like uh, this year. And so uh, I think Dr. Perry mentioned this as well, as uh, brine fly, the brine fly life cycle relies on these microbialites. Uh, they attach to these uh, in the middle of the winter uh, and then do exactly like Bonnie says, they hatch out and this is uh, uh, usually clouds and clouds of these uh, uh, brine flies uh, uh, pop out in the summer and they, they are food for everything. I do disagree with what Bonnie said. Uh, if you're out on the, the shoreline and you see these clouds of uh, brine flies, uh, they don't bite you. Uh, all of, all they do, uh, at this time of year. So she, she mentioned that, uh, they have their most fun when they're in the larval stage. Uh, basically all the adults do are mate. Uh, so I would say that's when they probably have the most fun. <laughs> So that's a high source of protein for these birds. The other thing that's been mentioned is the high salinity, and this looks like a really busy graph, but, uh, and all of these different colored uh, lines here are different, uh, represent different years. Uh, we've been measuring salinity for a long time, but I'll just direct your attention to the dark lines. The uh, black one is actually uh, the average of the salinities that we see. 
And then the red uh, is what we saw this year, so far uh, exceeding any uh, value that we've had in the past. And that impacts both uh, zooplankton that are in the uh, south arm of the lake, which is the brine uh, flies and the brine shrimp. Uh, so that has an impact on uh, these nesting birds. So a few uh, that are, uh, I'll just highlight a couple of birds that are this area is really important for. Gadwalls, uh, this is the largest breeding ground for gadwalls in the western U.S., um, 40,000 strong. Uh, a lot of times we get quadruple that uh, when they're migrating. Farmington Bay is one of the most uh, productive areas for uh, uh, gadwalls, and you can see from this uh, map that uh, Basically, uh, Great Salt Lake is kind of a hub for uh, uh, the gadwalls. Can't talk about uh, birds without mentioning uh, pelicans. They're the most uh, obvious one that you see when you're uh, an easily identify, uh, identifiable. Uh, almost anybody can tell what a pelican is, and we've got the, one of the largest breeding colonies of American white pelicans in the world here at uh, Great Salt Lake. And they're nesting at Gunnison Island, uh, which is why the uh, water here is pink, and you would uh, you realize that there are no uh, fish in that, but they still utilize it. Um, 20,000 is uh, about where our peak uh, uh, number of adults for breeding here has been, but in recent years, uh, that's about half. Um, so the reason they use this, even though there's no fish, is because they're, the, the island is protected. Uh, great, uh, the Division of Wildlife owns the island. There's a one-mile halo around it, so people can't uh, go on there. Uh, and it's typically, when it is an island, uh, inaccessible to predators. However, it's been uh, a little more accessible lately because it's not an island. And so uh, when I say predators, I'm mostly talking about coyotes and that has had an impact on uh, numbers. Uh, so not only do uh, we get the pelicans that breed on Gunnison Island, but uh, these marshes along the uh, Wasatch Front um, uh, that we manage for uh, uh, waterfowl habitat uh, also have a lot of carp in them. And so uh, we get uh, non-breeding pelicans that come here. So uh, pelicans don't reach sexual maturity until about the age of three. So a lot of these birds uh, just come here just for uh, the good food. And it takes uh, uh, a pelican chick. It requires about 150 pounds of fish for it to uh, raise uh, or once it hatches to uh, be able to fly uh, and reach uh, fledging age. And so uh, that's a lot of food over the course of the summer. And these uh, adult pelicans have to, have to travel uh, sometimes great distances. Typically, they would like to feed uh, close to uh, their nesting grounds. Uh, and that would be Bear River Bay or uh, Willard Spur or some of the marshes, but uh, we've put satellite transmitters on these and been able to track them uh, to different places. And they go over 100 miles uh, uh, to get uh, some of their uh, uh, fish for their uh, young. And the farther they have to travel, the less likely they are to succeed in nesting. So uh, it's better when we have a little uh, little bit of marsh uh, on the eastern side. So we'll go from one of the largest uh, birds to one of the smallest, the snowy plover. And Great Salt Lake hosts the lar uh, world's largest assemblage of snowy plovers. Almost a quarter of the entire breeding population uh, in the west is here. And they're nesting mostly on the shoreline. So uh, these mud flats are uh, uh, western shores of Great Salt Lake, and they're, of course, taking advantage of the brine flies and the brine shrimp when they're here. Uh, and hopefully those uh, numbers are good enough to supply uh, uh, the snowy plovers to be successful. So redheads are another species of duck that uh, had been a real popular species here, 20,000 breeding adults, 150,000 migrating. And before the floods, uh, it uh, 
Great Salt Lake had the con greatest concentration of breeding redheads in North America in terms of uh, birds per wetland acre. Uh, unfortunately, after the uh, lake receded, um, it uh, diminished a lot of the habitat uh, for uh, redheads, so that's a loss of uh, nesting habitat due to the expansion of Phragmites. Uh, so uh, the bulrush, uh, the alkali bulrush stands uh, basically were taken over by this invasive uh, species and that's reduced the number of uh, redheads nesting here. Uh, one of the other things, and this is probably not as important, uh, is carp uh, with the sediments that they stir up. Uh, they reduce the amount of pond weed available to these birds, and that's also had an impact uh, on redheads. So what's good for pelicans, not so good for uh, redheads. So that's the bad news. Redheads, uh, we've lost a lot of habitat uh, with them. However, there's uh, plenty of habitat for blondes and brunettes, so we're not so much worried about them. Uh, I'm just making sure you guys were all paying attention. <laughs> so avocets are another species. They're one of the ones that we're uh, probably going to list as a species of greatest conservation need. Uh, we had had uh, uh, close to a, qu a quarter of a million at peak counts, uh, but this is back in the late 90s, uh, and that's higher than any other wetland in the Pacific Flyway. Um, they uh, are showing up right now and uh, want to nest on some of the islands or the uh, shallow alkaline wetlands, but as uh, Bear River Bay and Ogden Bay and uh, uh, Farmington Bay have kind of diminished to just a mud flat, it doesn't provide a lot of nesting habitat for avocets, so we've seen those numbers uh, uh, cut in half as well. Uh, so Farmington Bay has been a kind of a stronghold for avocets, and we're just not seeing as many nests here. So which state has the most uh, California goals? You would think it's California, but it's not. It's Utah. We have the largest breeding population of uh, California goals in the world, so maybe we should switch the name to Utah goal, I guess. Uh, we've had uh, documented 160 uh, thousand breeding adults, and if they're successful, they usually uh, about double uh, that number. But they're mostly nesting on these islands, and right now there are no islands on Great Salt Lake, so uh, their uh, success have been, has been reduced uh, considerably. And like everybody says, they're taking advantage of both brine shrimp and brine flies. Uh, especially during the nesting season, they are really keyed in on brine flies because that's a high source of protein to raise their chicks. Almost always, uh, goals will uh, have three chicks, uh, an odd number, but I think the reason uh, for that is because it's a lot easier to sit on three eggs than it is to sit on two eggs. And if you think about it, it'd be uncomfortable on your butt to sit on two eggs, and I, I'm certain I verified that with this uh, picture here. This is an actual uh, nest, and this uh, gull had only two eggs, and it was so uncomfortable it found a tennis ball to sit on. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure only two of these uh, eggs hatched. Uh, if the other one did, I'd be really surprised. Uh, Pete Sampras or something came out of there. Uh, so now we're moving into uh, fall migration, and this is when we see the most birds at Great Salt Lake. So the highest numbers of birds uh, at any time of the year is going to be in the, our fall migration. Uh, this is uh, when Great Salt Lake is uh, really productive, uh, both out on the lake as well as the marshes, and we see the most numbers of uh, uh, shorebirds at this time. So not only do we peak in... Uh, uh, diversity, uh, uh, diverse, diversity of species of shorebirds, but we also just see uh, the sheer numbers at this time of year. Uh, not only uh, do, do we get a lot of shorebirds, but this is, of course, uh, waterfowl season as well, so we see a lot of ducks, a lot of times between three and five million 
uh, or it had been between three and five million when we also had water uh, in the, the lake. And this is a picture of a green wing teal. And if you're gonna harvest a, a, a duck or see a duck uh, in the marsh, this is kind of what we call our bread and butter duck because that's uh, what we see the most of at this time of year. Over half a million uh, green wing teal. Um, they're all throughout uh, our marshes, so you can't hardly go uh, bird watching uh, in the fall and not see a green wing teal. Um, and they're coming from their nesting grounds in the boreal forests of Canada and Alaska. Uh, and then they spend most of their fall here from September, uh, usually towards the end of December. Can't talk about any birds on Great Salt Lake without mentioning eared grebes because uh, Great Salt Lake is so uh, tied to these birds because uh, they eat brine shrimp and we manage the brine shrimp fishery. Uh, they exclusively eat brine shrimp when they're here in the fall. So 99.99% of their diet is uh, uh, brine shrimp and they become flightless when they're here. So it's really critical that uh, once they arrive here that there is a food source because uh, they are, uh, once they molt, um, uh, they're unable to take off and leave here, so uh, they're restricted to this area and they are reliant on uh, having that brine shrimp uh, food for them. And when they do come here, they're in such large numbers, it almost seems like you can walk across uh, these birds and uh, step on their backs and not uh, even get wet. So one eared grebe will eat 25 to 30,000 brine shrimp per day. And, and I didn't say that wrong. That's one grebe eats 25 to 30,000 brine shrimp per day. And I, uh, one of the previous biologists on the program had calculated that uh, uh, the numbers of brine shrimp in the south arm of the Great Salt Lake was the equivalent of uh, the same uh, equivalent of the biomass of uh, 13,500 bull African elephants. So uh, that's a lot of production uh, on a good year. And so uh, how do you eat an elephant? That's the, what everybody always asks, one bite at a time. So these eared grebes can eat an elephant, uh, one brine shrimp bite at a time. So they, uh, these birds, how do we know how many there, there are here? We fly over, uh, take pictures of them uh, out of an airplane. Uh, then we take those uh, pictures, they're at a, a specific altitude. We take those back in and it's basically just dots on a, a, a photograph and somebody has to count all the dots to figure out how many grebes uh, there are at Great Salt Lake. And usually we get between two and five million. Uh, and so uh, that sometimes can be as much as 99% of the entire uh, eared grebe uh, population. Um, so 5 million eared grebes eating 25 to 30,000 brine shrimp a day for uh, about three months out of the year is a lot. So I don't know how many. That's a lot of zeros. So I did, my calculator didn't go that high. Now when these birds leave, there's in such great uh, big flocks that you can actually see them on uh, radar. So sometimes these, these flocks will be 10 miles wide, uh, 50 miles long, uh, and they only fly at night because they're not very good flyers, and so uh, they only risk flying out of uh, Great Salt Lake at night. And usually once they start leaving, which is uh, typically in December when the brine shrimp uh, all freeze to death, uh, that's when we know that uh, we've hit uh, a point where we've gotten to the last part of our uh, seasons, uh, which is winter. And you wouldn't think that Great Salt Lake, uh, most areas that ha that freeze over, they don't provide a lot of opportunity for birds, uh, but Great Salt Lake, so salty enough, it typically doesn't freeze. Uh, and I say it usually doesn't freeze. We do sometimes get uh, an ice sheet uh, from some of the freshwater inflows like Bear River Bay and uh, our crew's got to cut through that. Uh, still, even at that time, we get uh, uh, goals, California goals, as well as uh, ringbill goals that uh, are here in the middle of the winter uh, utilizing the lake. And they're still eating brine shrimp and uh, brine flies, unless they're in a parking lot eating french fries or something. 
then probably one of the uh, most uh, uh, recognizable, because it's uh, our national symbol, is the uh, bald eagle. And Great Salt Lake is one of the top 10 winter, has one of the top 10 wintering populations of bald eagles in the lower 48. Usually well over 500 eagles come here. And when they're here, they're mostly uh, looking at, we draw our marshes down uh, on the waterfowl management areas uh, just to protect the infrastructure. And when we do that, it exposes a lot of these carp that have been swimming around all summer. Uh, and uh, they're out on the mud flat, and that's what those eagles are uh, keyed in on. So they come and feed on the carp uh, in the dead of winter. So peak numbers, uh, February and um, March. One of the other species of uh, birds, uh, common golden eye, and they spend their time on the pelagic portions of uh, Great Salt Lake, so clear on the western side, uh, and they take advantage of uh, uh, the brine fly uh, larva. We have numbers that exceed or have uh, approached 50,000 uh, in the dead of winter, and that's one of the largest wintering inland populations ever recorded in North America, uh, about twice as much as the lower Great uh, Lakes uh, has counted. And like I said, they're here to feed on those brine fly larvae that are uh, primarily focus, or, uh, uh, focused over those microbial light fields. Uh, so they're uh, diving down at this time of year and just picking these uh, uh, larva off of those microbialites. Uh, however, the problem with that is that recent years we've seen uh, significant uh, loss or drying up of these microbialites, so that doesn't really, uh, you're not going to see a lot of birds diving in that location. So uh, we've seen our uh, uh, golden eye numbers uh, plummet, so we don't see near as many uh, in the last uh, decade or so. So I hope that gives you kind of uh, an idea of where we are as far as uh, uh, birds um, on Great Salt Lake. I will uh, just uh, mention a couple things here at the end. We've all seen these uh, articles in the news, the Great Salt Lake's drying up uh, uh, in five years, it's gonna be gone. I just wanted to kind of mention, and I think uh, Dr. Perry and everybody's kind of mentioned this a little bit, we've faced these crises before. Uh, and just as an example, in the early 1900s, uh, these water diversions, uh, and I think Sarah mentioned this uh, too, uh, these uh, started to deplete our uh, wetlands. So. Uh, as we started making canals and things, uh, we started seeing uh, our wetlands drop and then huge botulism outbreaks. And as a result, our legislature uh, at the time uh, appropriated money to purchase public shooting grounds to protect it as a wetland and uh, one of the, uh, I think the first ever uh, uh, waterfowl hunting grounds uh, purchased uh, uh, by state money. Then, uh, not long after, Bear River Migratory Bird Refuge, uh, uh, Locomotive Springs, Farmington Bay, um, and Ogden Bay. In fact, Ogden Bay um, was the first ever, uh, first ever dollars that uh, came from the Pippin Robertson funding uh, went to Ogden Bay. So Utah used the uh, first ever dollars uh, of that Pittman Robertson money here in uh, uh, Utah. So those things uh, occurred in uh, the early 1900s. Utah re recognized that there was an issue and uh, we uh, uh, met, with, met that crisis and was, were able to overcome it. Uh, similarly, earlier on in this, uh, uh, in the early 2000s, we started seeing habitat loss uh, here uh, as well. And this is a photograph of Phragmites, which has encroached on a lot of uh, habitat, as well as all throughout the watershed. And Great Salt Lake, or, or Utah, um, uh, started what was called the Water, Watershed Restoration Initiative, or WRI. And its intent was to increase watershed health and biological diversity 
uh, improve uh, water quality and yield, as well as promote opportunities for sustainable uses of natural resources. So this uh, program has, and I looked it up uh, just recently, there's been over 2,500 projects completed to uh, over uh, about two and a half million acres uh, have been treated and uh, $350 million uh, spent on this uh, program. And that's state, federal, private uh, conservation uh, groups, all contributing to improve uh, uh, the watershed. So again, there was a, a crisis and uh, Utah did something about it. For our part, uh, we've uh, had uh, treated a lot of Phragmites in the, our uh, WMAs, 50,000 acres to where it's re been reduced to about 20% of its, uh, uh, of what it originally was. Um, and it's also, this money has also been used for uh, the sedimentation projects and building up islands to create, ha create habitat for nesting birds. Um, we've uh, also taken advantage of it to uh, re uh, build some of the dikes that were washed out in the 80s, as well as uh, provide new units uh, uh, built on our WMAs. And not only that, but sometimes when uh, private lands uh, are up for sale, uh, we've used that money as, uh, uh, to act, uh, as an acquisition uh, for that. So again, uh, a crisis uh, averted uh, um, utilizing, and we've actually had uh, calls from a lot of other states asking how, how did you implement this program and get everybody on, on board? Because it spans uh, uh, a lot of different uh, groups. One of the last things that I'll mention is we had an issue uh, in the 90s uh, we, uh, with the commercial brine shrimp fishery taking off. There was a potential for this becoming, uh, you know, a concern for uh, over exploitation of this uh, resource and then have it impact uh, wildlife. Uh, but the industry uh, uh, got together with uh, wildlife and they asked to be regulated and they wanted to uh, make sure that uh, we policed them as well as done, did the research. And that's, uh, uh, I'm probably um, biased, but uh, that's probably uh, made it one of the best regular or best uh, managed uh, commercial fisheries in the world, because a lot of them uh, have hit that exploitation issue. So uh, as a result, uh, uh, Great Salt Lake supplies still about 40 to 50% of the worldwide demand for uh, brine shrimp. So it's successful as far as industry goes. And uh, I would say 5 million eared grebes that have full tummies can't be wrong. So it, Again, this was a, a problem that uh, was seen and solved. Um, and so I'll leave you the, with this quote uh, from Aldo uh, Leopold, and we kind of uh, stole that and used it as part of our uh, conservation objective at Great Salt Lake, and that's develop an informed, perceptive, and enduring constituency working toward long-term GSL ecosystem health and harmony between men and land. And that, uh, that sounds like something that Darren Perry would say because uh, uh, he's always stressing that. So maybe we uh, uh, are on the right track if uh, we're doing something uh, that he's talked about. So I have a picture of the, uh, the railroad causeway here. And just recently, uh, the governor uh, raised the berm and uh, Dr. Perry talked about that earlier. Um, there's some give and take there, but that uh, that just occurred in the last couple of months, and that is uh, the intent. There is to decrease the sal salinity as well as uh, bring the water levels up to inundate a lot of those microbialite habitats. So this is uh, another thing, the hard decision that had to be uh, made, and it's uh, uh, happened just recently. So. Basically, my takeaway from this is uh, uh, Utah, in the, in, in the face of insurmountable odds, we have had a history of overcoming these challenges. So um, I, I have end with a message of hope, I guess. So, and with that, I'm, I'm done and probably time to eat. <laughs> uh, elected officials, and I'm just a dude that likes 
wildlife. So 